Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father and our God, what a privilege it is to come together to open your holy word, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to discover what your will is for us in these last days. We ask that as we study the story of Enoch, that your Holy Spirit will be with us and teach us the lessons which will be useful and profitable as we live in this la these last days of human history. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of your presence. And Father, we just ask, we plead that you will be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. We want to begin our study today by turning in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. As we've studied before in this seminar, this verse is actually a pickup on Genesis 3.15. And uh, it's actually speaking about the end time remnant of God on planet Earth. The remnant that will go through the final tribulation and will actually uh, be in this world when Jesus comes. It says here in Revelation 12 verse 17, and the dragon, that is the devil, was enraged with the woman. The woman represents the church. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, or the remnant of her seed. The remnant is the last portion of God's people. And now notice that this remnant has two characteristics. It says, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Notice that the end time remnant will keep the commandments of God and will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now the question is, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? We know that the commandments of God means the Ten Commandments. But the testimony of Jesus, we need to take a look at what the Bible has to say about that. What is the testimony of Jesus? Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. Here we have a clear explanation as to what the testimony of Jesus is, which, will, which the remnant will possess in the end of time. It says there, by the way, a majestic being appears to John, uh, who is the writer of the book of Revelation, and we find these words about the encounter. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, that is, the angel says to John, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. What do the brethren of John have? They have the testimony of Jesus. And then it says, Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So here we have a definition of what the testimony of Jesus is. It is the spirit of prophecy. Which means that the end time remnant is going to keep the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, and they are going to have the testimony of Jesus, which is the gift of prophecy, or the spirit of prophecy. Now there's a third characteristic that this end time remnant is going to have. And that characteristic is found in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. And by the way, this verse repeats one detail which we already read in Revelation 12, 17. It says here, speaking about the end time remnant, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God, we've already seen that in 12, 17, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the end time remnant has faith. Not any old kind of faith, but the faith of Jesus. The faith that Jesus had. And so we find three characteristics in these verses about the end time remnant. They keep the commandments of God. They have the testimony of Jesus, which is the gift of prophecy or the spirit of prophecy. And they also have an unbreakable faith the faith of Jesus. Now in order to understand fully this end time generation, we have to go to the time before the flood. 
and I'd like you to invite you to go with me to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. We're actually going to talk about one of the most spectacular events recorded in the Old Testament. Now allow me to give you just a little bit of a chronology about this event. It took place 987 years after creation. That means that it took place 669 years before the flood. And actually, it would further mean that it happened 549 years before Noah began preaching, 120 years before the flood. Now, we're going to talk about this event in our study tonight. It's really spectacular. And uh, let's take a look once again at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 and read about the condition of the world before the flood. It says there, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the condition of the world before the flood was in, in a dire situation. The world had become almost totally corrupted according to this. Now we find in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 to 39 that the condition of the world before the flood is actually symbolic or representative of the condition of the world before the second coming of Christ. Notice Matthew chapter 24 and verses 37 to 39. It says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now did you notice here that there's a comparison between the days of Noah and the coming of the Son of Man. It continues saying, For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now what I want you to notice is that the world was in a condition in the days of Noah similar to the condition it will be in shortly before the second coming of Christ. Now with this in mind, we want to study the story about a very special hero that we find recorded in Genesis chapter 5. His name is Enoch. Now before we take a look at Enoch, we need to notice some very interesting details that we find in Genesis chapter 5. We're going to discover that before the flood there were two different types of faithful people. Two different types of righteous people. And you're saying, I thought there was only one kind of righteous person. Well, in a certain sense there is. But in the sense that we're noticing tonight, we're going to see that there were two categories of righteous people. The first category of righteous person are those who died before the coming of the flood which represents, by the way, the second coming of Jesus, as we read in Matthew chapter 24. Let's go in our Bibles to Genesis chapter 5, and let's read several verses in this chapter about what happened with many of these heroes that are mentioned here, actually the genealogy which eventually will end up with Jesus Christ. We'll begin at verse 5. We're going to jump to several verses here. It says, so all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Let's go to verse 8. All the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Verse 11. All the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Let's go to verse 14. All the days of Canaan were 910 years, and he died. Verse 17, all the days of Mahalaliel were 895 years, and he died. Verse 20, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Verse 27, all the days of Methuselah 
were 969 years, and he died. Verse 31, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And then we jump to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 29. It says, all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So you'll notice that before the flood, one category of believer was the believer that died before the coming of the flood. But I want you to notice that there is a second kind of believer before the flood. Notice Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24. I skipped over one individual in this genealogy of Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24, the second category of believer. It says here in Genesis 5 verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now did you notice that? And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And somebody might say, well, when it says that God took him, it means that he died and God took him to heaven with him. Because, uh, you know, we speak today about when a person dies, God took him. Now is that exactly what the Bible is trying to teach here? Absolutely not. You say, how do we know that? Because there's a text in Hebrews 11 and verse 5 which explains Genesis 5, 24. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. Here it is explicit. It says here, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Now is that clear? He did die and then was taken. Here it says very clearly, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he what? That he pleased God. And so you have two different types of believers before the flood. You have those who die and go to the grave before the flood, and then you have those represented by Enoch who actually is taken to heaven without seeing death. Now obviously, Enoch is in a special category because he is the lone exception in this list. All of the rest died, but Enoch was transported to heaven without seeing death. What made Enoch so special? Well, before we answer that question, allow me to tell you that the Bible has very little to say about Enoch. There are actually only four passages or verses in Scripture that mention Enoch. Allow me to mention those for you. The first is Genesis chapter 5 verses 21 to 24. We just read from there. The second place where Enoch is mentioned is in Luke 3.37. This is the genealogy of Jesus. Only his name is mentioned there. And then you have Hebrews 11 and verse 5, which is the verse that we just read where it says that he didn't see death, that uh, God actually took him. And finally, a very significant verse is found in Jude, verse 14, and also verse 15. And so we have four passages that speak about Enoch. Genesis 5, 21 to 24, Luke 3, 37, Hebrews 11, 5, and Jude 14 and 15. And so you might say, how can you preach a whole sermon on Enoch if the Bible has so little to say about him? Well, even though we only have four verses that mention Enoch, those four verses are filled with information and with meaning. And so we're going to take a look at the characteristics that distinguished Enoch in a special way from the other people who are mentioned as dying before the flood. There are four specific things which are mentioned in these verses about Enoch who was transported to heaven from among the living. Those four things that are mentioned are number one, he walked with God. Number two, 
He pleased God. Number three, he had faith in God. And number four, he had the testimony of Jesus or the gift of prophecy. Now we, we get these details from the texts, from the four texts that are mentioned in Scripture. And so we want to take a look at these characteristics. Notice Genesis chapter 5 and verse 24 once again. We read this verse before to show that God took Enoch. But now let's notice the first part of this verse. It says, And Enoch did what? And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Now, I might mention a very important detail. And that is that in Genesis 5, we are told that Enoch walked with God after he had Methuselah for 300 years. That's significant. Because Enoch lived to be 365 before he was taken to heaven by God. It doesn't say that the first 65 years he walked with God, although undoubtedly he walked with God. But there was a special sense in which Enoch walked with God from the 65th year of his life through the 365th year of his life. And you say, what was that? Well, in our second textbook, the book Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White explains that when Enoch had Methuselah, he understood better than ever before how God feels for his children. Because now Enoch had a son and he could understand the father-son relationship so much better in the light of having a son. He knew what it was like for God to feel for his earthly children. And so we're told here that in a special sense he walked with God after he had Methuselah. Now notice also Hebrews 11 and verse 5. Not only did he walk with God, but we're told that he did something else. Actually, it's the same thing as walking with God, but a different expression is used. It says in Hebrews 11 verse 5, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found, because God had taken him. And now notice this. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased. God. What does it mean to walk with God? It means to what? To please God. In other words, Enoch walked with God. Enoch pleased God. But do you know that Enoch also had faith in God? Notice what we find in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. After saying that Enoch pleased God, notice what we find in this verse. But without faith, it is impossible to what? To please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So Enoch pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to what? To please Him. So you'll notice three characteristics so far. And we're going to notice that they're very closely related. First of all, he walked with God. Secondly, he pleased God. In the third place, he had faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now the fourth characteristic is found in Jude, verses 14 and 15. This is that little book right before the book of Revelation. Jude 14 and 15. It says here about Enoch, now Enoch, the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also saying. Now let's stop there just for a moment. What did Enoch do? He prophesied. Do you know who he was prophesying about? Actually he was prophesying about two groups. The first group of wicked people that he was prophesying about was the pre-flood race that we've already read about in Genesis 6 verse 5 that every intent of the hearts uh, and their, their imaginations was only evil continually. He was prophesying about them. 
but he was also prophesying about a wicked generation shortly before the second coming of Jesus because as it was before the flood so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man so he's looking at both of these groups and so it says now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also saying behold the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute what? judgment on all to execute what? judgment on all did Enoch preach the judgment? he most certainly did he was a prophecy that announced the judgment and so it says to execute judgment on all now let's stop there was Enoch a prophet? yes he was did he then have the testimony of Jesus? did he rebuke iniquity? did he announce that God was going to come in judgment? absolutely and so we notice four characteristics about Enoch first of all he walked with God secondly he pleased God in the third place he had faith because without faith it is impossible to please God and in the fourth place he was a prophet and so he had the testimony of Jesus. But now we need to take a look at what all of these things mean. What does it mean to walk with God? What does it mean to please God? What does it mean when the Bible says that Enoch had faith? And let's understand a little bit better what the testimony of Jesus is, what the gift of prophecy is. And so first of all we want to notice what it means to walk with God because Enoch is a symbol of the end time generation now notice Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 the book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 what does it mean to walk with God? it says here can two walk together unless they are what? unless they are agreed must you be of one mind with God in order to walk with God according to this verse? can you be at odds with God and be walking with God? absolutely not now there's a very very interesting characteristic about the expression walking in the Old Testament as well as in the New almost every time that the expression walk is used in this sense of walking with God it has to do with keeping God's commandments I want to read several verses from scripture that illustrate this point go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verses 12 and 13 Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verses 12 and 13 walking with God is linked with keeping God's commandments it says there in Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 12 and now Israel what does the Lord God require of you but to fear the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to love him to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you today for your good do you notice all of the parallel expressions in this verse? you have for example to fear the Lord your God to walk in all his ways to love him to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord so let me ask you what does it mean to walk with God? it means to fear him it means to walk in his commandments it means to love him that was true of Enoch that was the experience of Enoch walking with God now let's notice two or three other texts notice Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 4 Deuteronomy chapter 13 and verse 4 here God is speaking to his people and he says you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and do what? 
and keep his commandments. That's the expression we found in Revelation 12, 17. And keep his commandments. And then what does it say? And obey his voice. And you shall serve him and hold fast to him. What does it mean to walk with the Lord? It means to keep his commandments, to obey his voice, to serve him, and to hold fast to him. Would that be what Enoch did? if he walked with God? You see, you let Scripture explain Scripture. When you find the expression, walk with God, you have to see what it means to walk with God in the light of all of Scripture. Notice Psalm 78 and verse 10. Here it's even more explicit what it means to walk with God. It says in Psalm 78 and verse 10, speaking about Israel, they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to what? They refuse to walk in His law. What do you walk in? You walk in God's law, according to this. Let me ask you, did Enoch walk in God's law? Did he keep God's commandments? Did he obey the voice of the Lord? Yes, if you compare these scriptures with Genesis 5, you'll notice that he did. You see, when you only have that expression, he walked with God, you have to go to other places in scripture that explain what it means to walk with God. Notice also Psalm 119 and verse 1. Psalm 119 and verse 1. It says here, by the way, this is David the psalmist who is writing, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who walk how? Who walk in the law of the Lord. Was Enoch a law keeper? Was he obedient to God's commandments? He most certainly was. By the way, does this remind us of Revelation 12, 17? The people who keep the commandments of God in the end time generation? Now notice 1 John 2, 3 to 6. Because somebody might say, well, this was just Israel in the Old Testament. So let's notice a text from the New Testament. 1 John chapter 2 and verses 3 to 6. It says here, By this we know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments, how do we know that we know God? If we what? If we keep His commandments. By the way, this is the same author of Revelation 12, 17, the same writer, not the same author, because God is the author, but the same writer. Now notice this. He who says, I know Him, and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word... Truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to what? To walk just as he walked. Is walking with God linked here with keeping God's commandments? It most certainly is. So when Genesis tells us that Enoch walked with God, it's another way of saying that Enoch obeyed God and kept his what? And kept his commandments. Is that one of the characteristics of the end time generation that will live before the second coming, like Enoch lived before the flood? Absolutely. But now we need to take a look at what it means to please God. And by the way, walk with God and please God are synonymous. I don't know whether you caught that. In Genesis, we're told that Enoch walked with God. In Hebrews, we're told that before Enoch was translated, he pleased God. So to walk with God is the same as what? It's the same as to please God. Now what does the Bible mean when it says that a person pleases God? Notice 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. It says here, And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we what? Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. What is pleasing in the Lord's sight? Keeping His what? His commandments. Does that square with what it means to walk with God? Absolutely. And so it says here that God answers our prayers because we keep His commandments and we do those things that are pleasing in His sight. By the way, this is the way Jesus lived. 
Notice John chapter 8 and verse 29. John chapter 8 and verse 29. It says here, Jesus is speaking, And He who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. Now why hasn't the Father left him alone? For I always what? I always do those things that please him. Is pleasing God, or rather does pleasing God have anything to do with obeying God and doing what God expects us to do? Absolutely. Jesus himself says so. He says, The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please Him. By the way, the Apostle Paul tells us that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The expression, to live in the flesh, means that you haven't been converted. It means that, that you have a fleshly existence. You have a selfish nature that is dictating your behavior. Let's notice Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verses 7 and 8. Romans chapter 8 and verses 7 and 8. It says here, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law, law of God, nor indeed can be. Is the fleshly nature in conflict with the law of God? Absolutely. And then notice, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Are you catching the connection here between the fleshly person and keeping the commandments of God? The fleshly person cannot keep the commandments of God, which means that they cannot do what? They cannot please God according to this. And by the way, if you go to Galatians chapter 5, you're going to notice what the works of the flesh are. They are actually violations of the Ten Commandments. Notice the list that the Apostle Paul gives, and I'm reading from the NIV because there's some words in the uh, New King James that are difficult to understand. This is the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and then he says, and the like. Those are the works of the flesh. Let me ask you, are all of those violations of God's Ten Commandments? Those people who practice these things, are they really pleasing God? No, because they're living according to the flesh, and living according to the flesh brings as a result the works of the flesh. And so we find that Enoch walked with God, he pleased God, which basically means that Enoch obeyed God's commandments. It means that, that Enoch followed the will of God. He feared the Lord, he loved the Lord, he obeyed the Lord, he kept his, kept his commandments, he walked with Him, in other words. Allow me to read you a very interesting statement from our second textbook, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 85, on Enoch. It says here, Enoch's walk with God was not in a trance or vision, but in all the duties of his daily life. He did not become a hermit, shutting himself entirely from the world, for he had a work to do for God in the world. And now notice this, in the family, and in his intercourse with men, as a husband and father, a friend, a citizen, he was steadfast, unwavering servant of the Lord. In other words, walking with God meant that he walked with God in all the areas of life and in all of his relationships. And of course, when we remember that the law of God is a law of relationships, because basically it means to love God and to love our neighbor, we understand that Enoch loved God and his neighbor, and it was manifested in obedience to the commandments of God. Now we also have found that Enoch had faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, 
what kind of faith did Enoch have and where was his faith focused? It says by faith Enoch. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, where was his faith focused? Well, in order to understand this, we need to understand what faith is. Go with me to Hebrews 11 and verse 1. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. This is the standard definition for faith. It says here, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What is faith? The substance of things that you what? That you hope for. The evidence of things that you have not what? Seen. So must Enoch have hoped for something that he didn't have yet? Of course. Must he have desired to see something that at that point he did not see? Of course. And the question is, where was his faith focused? Oh, there's this beautiful statement that's found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 87. I want to read it to you. It's beautiful. It says here, But Enoch's heart was upon eternal treasures. He had looked upon the celestial city. Did you notice that? He had looked upon the celestial city. He had seen the king in his glory in the midst of Zion. His mind, his heart, his conversation were in heaven. Where was his faith focused? Was he hoping for heaven? Yes. Could he actually see heaven with his physical eyes? No. But did he see heaven with the eye of faith? He most certainly did. He longed for heaven. She continues saying, The greater the existing iniquity, the more earnest was his longing for the home of God. While still on earth, he dwelt by faith in the realms of light. In other words, his faith was a hope that someday he could live with God in heaven, which he could not see with his physical eyes, but which he grasped by faith. Have you ever heard the expression, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good? You know, I like to change that around, and I like to say, he's so earthly minded, he's no heavenly good. And the fact is that Enoch, he was heavenly minded, but that did not keep him from fulfilling his daily duties of love to God and love to his fellow human beings. But he knew that this world was not his home. His faith was focused on eternal realities, not the phantoms of this world. So we've noticed three characteristics. Number one, Enoch walked with God. That means keeping his commandments. Enoch pleased God. That means that you don't walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. It means that you're not at enmity with the love, law of God, but you're in love with the law of God. Enoch had faith. His faith was focused on heavenly realities. Even though he was on earth, he was walking with the King in the New Jerusalem by faith. By the way, are these the very three characteristics that we started our study with? What is the end time generation going to have? They are going to keep what? the commandments of God. Are they going to have the faith of Jesus? Absolutely. Are they going to be the Enoch generation? Of course. But there's one more characteristic, and that is in Jude 14 and 15. Let's read this passage again. It says here, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his saints. By the way, this is after the millennium. I won't get into that. To execute judgment on all. The execution of the judgment against the wicked is when? Not at the second coming, but after the millennium. To execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds. Um, if I could just make a parenthesis there, is there going to be a huge panorama above the holy city where the wicked are going to be convicted of their unrighteousness? Yes. You see, usually we apply this to the second coming of Christ. 
but technically in context it's applying to events after the millennium. And so verse 15 says to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Did Enoch warn the world of a coming judgment? And the need that people had of committing their lives to the Lord? Absolutely. Would you expect that in the end time the Enoch generation would also have in their midst a prophet who would announce the judgment and the need to prepare for that judgment so that we're on the right side? Of course. Now allow me to read you some interesting statements about this aspect of Enoch. Patriarchs and Prophets page 85. I just love this chapter about Enoch. There's so much wonderful light in it about Enoch. It says here, through, now notice this, through holy angels God revealed to Enoch his purpose to destroy the world by a flood. And he also opened more fully to him the plan of redemption. He did it through the holy what? Through the holy angel. And now notice this. By the spirit of prophecy he carried him down through the generations that should live after the flood and showed him the great events connected with the second coming of Christ and the end of the world. What did Enoch have according to this? By the what? By the spirit of prophecy. Is that the identical expression that we found about the end time remnant in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 and Revelation 19 verse 10? Absolutely. By the way, was Enoch a fearless rebuker of sin? He most certainly was. Allow me to read you this statement, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 86. See today we live in a world of political correctness where ne nobody wants to call sin by its right name. But Enoch did not get caught up in that game. Enoch told things in love like they were. And he rebuked sin and he called sinners to allow the Holy Spirit to change their lives so that they would be found on the right side in the coming judgment. We find this statement. He was a fearless reprover of sin. While he preached the love of God in Christ to the people of his time, and pleaded with them to forsake their evil ways, he rebuked the prevailing iniquity and warned the men of his generation that judgment would surely be visited upon the transgressor. It was the Spirit of Christ that spoke through Enoch. What was it? It was the Spirit of Christ that spoke through Enoch. That Spirit is manifested not alone in utterances of love, compassion, and entreaty. It is not smooth things only that are spoken by holy men. God puts into the hearts and lips of His messengers truths to utter that are keen and cutting as a two-edged sword. In this way Enoch was similar to Noah who also condemned the world, as it says in the book of Hebrews, and he became the heir of the righteousness that is by faith. One further statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 87, talks about the holiness of Enoch. It says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. For three hundred years Enoch had been seeking purity of soul, that he might be in harmony with heaven. What was he seeking? purity of soul, that he might be what? In harmony with heaven. For three centuries he had walked with God. Day by day he had longed for a closer union. Nearer and nearer had grown the communion until God took him to himself. He had stood at the threshold of the eternal world. Only a step between him and the land of the blessed. And now the portals opened. The walk with God so long pursued on earth continued as he passed through the gates of the holy city, the first from among men to enter there.
Wow. Do you know that the same author of Patriarchs and Prophets, Elohim, says this in the journal Signs of the Times, April 8, 1899. Notice. If we could have but one view of the celestial city, we would never wish to dwell on earth again. That was the experience of Eden. He became totally disconnected in his affections and, his, and in his mind with this world. He loved God so much, he wanted to please God so much, he wanted to keep God's commandments so much, he had so much faith in what he could not see and what he hoped for, that God finally said to Enoch, Enoch, you're not a citizen of earth anymore, you're only a citizen of heaven. Come up here and we'll continue walking on the street of gold throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. The Enoch generation will be just like that. They will walk with God. They will please God. They will have the faith of Jesus and they will have the testimony of Jesus which they will proclaim to a world that is living in rebellion. Now do you remember that at the, at the beginning of our study we noticed that there were two different categories of believers before the flood. There were those who died and there was the individual who was translated to heaven from among the living. Do you know that Enoch represents those who in the end time will be translated to heaven without seeing death. You know, it kind of reminds me of that scene on the Mount of Transfiguration. You've read that, where Jesus is at the top of this high mountain, and suddenly down from heaven come two individuals, Moses and Elijah. Let's pick up the story as it's found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, and verses 1 to 3. It says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. By the way, you can read that in Revelation 1, the glorified Christ. His face shines as the sun. Jesus here was glorified in a preliminary way. And so it says, His face shone like the sun, and His clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Him. Now why Moses and Elijah? Well, if you go to the Old Testament, you'll notice that Moses, at the end of his life, because of his sin, died, and he was resurrected, and he was taken to heaven. You can find that by carefully reading Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 and 6, and also Jude 9, where it says that there was a battle over the body of Moses, because Michael the archangel had come to resurrect Moses. And so you have Moses who died, resurrected, and ascended to heaven. But then you have that other individual, Elijah, where we're told in 2 Kings chapter 2 that Elijah, a, a chariot of fire came down, and it picked up Elijah, and it took him to heaven without experiencing death. In these two individuals, you have represented the two groups of people that will be in this world, of the righteous people that will be in this world when Jesus comes. You have those who died in Christ and will resurrect, and you have those who are alive and remain. In fact, let's notice what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 through 18. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 through 18. It says here, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, by the way, that Lord Himself is the same Lord that was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. With a shout, with the voice of an archangel. Ah, what's the name of that archangel? Michael, the same one who fought over the body of Moses. And so it says, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And now notice, and the dead in Christ will rise first. There you have represented by those who died before the flood. And you have those represented by Moses. And then notice verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain 
Those are represented by whom? By Enoch and who else? And Elijah. And those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Is there going to be an Enoch generation at the end of time who will bear the same characteristics as the original Enoch before the flood? Absolutely. In fact, allow me to read you a statement from Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 88 and 89, corroborating what we just studied from Scripture. This is a very significant statement. Notice what it says. The godly character of this prophet, that is Enoch, represents the state of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth at the time of Christ's second advent. Did you catch that? The state of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth. By the way, do you know there's only one type of uh, person who's going to be alive when Jesus comes? The 144,000. And they will have gained the total, total victory over sin. Now notice what this continues saying. Then, at the second coming, shortly before the second coming, as in the world before the flood, iniquity will prevail. Following the promptings of their corrupt hearts and the teachings of a deceptive philosophy, men will rebel against the authority of heaven. But like Enoch, God's people will seek for purity of heart and conformity to His will, until they shall reflect the likeness of Christ. Like Enoch, they will warn the world of the Lord's second coming, and of the judgments to be, be visited upon transgression, and by their holy conversation and example they will condemn the sins of the ungodly. Is there going to be a whole generation like Enoch? who are going to warn the world through the gift of prophecy, who are going to obey God, manifest His pure character, not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit? Absolutely. She continues saying, as Enoch was translated to heaven before the destruction of the world by water, so the living righteous will be translated from the earth before its destruction by fire. This is the generation that Jesus is waiting for, with a longing desire. Now you say, how in the world do we ever reach this state? Well, it's actually not as complicated as many people think. You see, the way that we reach this state is by that which we listen to and watch. You know, if our eyes are focused on earthly things, we will be earthly minded. If our eyes are focused on heavenly things, we will be heavenly minded. We all know that little, that little song, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in His wonderful face, and what will be the consequence? And the things of earth will grow what? Will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Here it's speaking about the secret. It's such a simple secret, but we find so difficult to follow the counsel of God. It says here, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What do we behold? The glory of the Lord. Do you know what the glory of the Lord is? The glory of the Lord is His character. It's His character. You can read that in, in Exodus. When Moses went to the top of the mount, Exodus chapter 32. By the way, is the glory of God contagious? You know, when Moses went up there and spent 40 days with the Lord, he came down from the mountain, and what was happening with his face? His face was shining or glowing because he had been with the Lord. If we want our faces to shine and to glow, what do we have to do? We have to spend time with the Lord. Because His glory is contagious. Now notice. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being what? Transformed. That's the word metamorphosis in Greek. It's a total and radical change. We are being transformed 
into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are what we watch and what we hear. If what we watch and hear is spiritually in tune with God, we will reveal the character of God. If what we watch and hear is focused upon the things of this world, we will be worldly minded, we will be carnally minded. It is a psychological principle of life. We are composed of what we eat physically, and we are composed of what we eat spiritually through our eyes and through our ears. And Enoch had his focus in the right place. His focus was on heaven. Once again I read that statement that I read before from Signs of the Times. You know, do you long for heaven? Do you long for Jesus to come? There's nothing in this world that is worth hanging on to, folks. It's all going to burn when Jesus comes. I want you to notice that statement as we close. If we could have but one view of the celestial city, just one view, just a glimpse, we would never wish to dwell on earth again.